welcome back in person to uh, the intellectual property of the Supreme Court series. We are delighted to be celebrating our 10th year of doing this. Our first uh, in this series was the Golan versus Holder case in 2012, and we've been at it ever since. Uh, and we're back in person, which is so exciting. And we have all of these folks who've traveled who are back in person. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Before we turn it over and start talking about art and uh, fair use, uh, I just wanted to put in a plug for our uh, Peter Yazi Distinguished Le Lecture, which is coming up on November 10th. And it's going to be by Peter, Professor Peter DeCherney up at the University of Pennsylvania, who is a longtime uh, clinic client who has participated in the DMCA rulemaking exemption or exemption rulemakings to get an exemption for the use of audiovisual works in instruction. Um, and he's going to reflect on that and talk about the sort of uh, framing of the issues over the years and, and what that means for thinking about copyright. So please come uh, and, and enjoy that uh, great uh, continuation of this copyright conversation. With that, I turn it over to my distinguished colleague, Professor Christine uh, Farley, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, uh, welcome. I'm so glad that you're all here. Um, and I'm so glad that we have a very uh, large um, and spread out audience online. Uh, and we hope all the technology works. Um, so I'm delighted um, to have this wonderful panel of speakers here today to talk about this really interesting case um, that was argued this morning. And my only fear is that we don't have enough time for all of the good con uh, con uh, uh, content and all of the good insights um, that these speakers could bring to this case. Um, and so I'm uh, very briefly going to introduce each speaker as they speak for the first time. Um, and uh, I'm going to very briefly now just give a bit of a background on the case for those of you who are not as familiar uh, with the case as our speakers are. Um, so this is a copyright fair use case that involves three artists, because I'll, I'll count prints, um, two are deceased. Um, and the uh, third uh, is uh, the uh, uh, Lynn Goldsmith, um, who is very much alive and kicking and was in the court today. And I invited her here today. I hope she'll show up. Lynn Goldsmith is an acclaimed professional photographer who is especially known for her celebrity portraits. Um, she has also founded a photo agency that focuses on licensing and selling fine art prints of her and other photographers' work. In 1981, on an assignment from Newsweek, Goldsmith photographed prints in her studio. The photo shoot produced only 12 black and white and 11 color images because Prince was very uncomfortable and left after a short while. In 1984, Goldsmith's agency, unbeknownst to Goldsmith, licensed Vanity Fair to use the black and white photo that you see now um, that is at issue in this case as an artist's reference for a forthcoming article. An artist's reference means that an artist would create a work of art uh, based on the image. Vanity Fair commissioned Andy Warhol to create an illustration of prints for the art based on this image for the uh, November 1984 issue. Vanity Fair gave attribution to Goldsmith for the source photograph in the article. Warhol had in fact created a series of 16 distinct works, silkscreen prints and pencil illustrations, all based on the Goldsmith photo. Warhol died in 1987 and the Andy Warhol Foundation was created afterward. The foundation sold or transferred 12 of the works and transferred the remaining four to the Warhol Museum. In 2016, Prince died, and after his death, Condé Nast, the parent company of Vanity Fair, published a special commemorative magazine devoted to Prince and featured on its cover a work from this Warhol Prince series. And it was only after this that Goldsmith first became aware of the fact that any of these Warhol works had been made. She was concerned about copyright violations, and she brought this to the attention of the Andy Warhol uh, Foundation. 
The foundation in 2017 sued Goldsmith for a declaratory judgment that the print series were non-infringing or in the alternative fair use. Goldsmith countersued for infringement. So the fair use test includes, considers four factors, and I'll tell them to you because I know that our speakers will talk about them. The first is the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. The second is the nature of the copyrighted work. The third is the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And the fourth is the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. In 2019, the Southern District of New York granted summary judgment to the Warhol Foundation on fair use, finding that all four factors favored the Warhol Foundation. The Second Circuit reversed finding that all four factors favored Goldsmith and that the print series was not a fair use as a matter of law and was substantially similar to the Goldsmith photograph as a matter of law. The Second Circuit viewed the work side by side, and I think we can advance to see the side by side. So there's the, yeah, um, the, uh, the series um, against the uh, Goldsmith photo photograph viewed them side by side uh, and concluded that the print series was not transformative. The Second Circuit found that the overarching purpose and function of both works were identical, both in the broad sense that they were both works of visual art and in the narrower sense that they were both depictions of prints. The Second Circuit said, crucially, the print series retains the essential elements of the Goldsmith photograph with out significantly adding to or altering those elements. So that's just a flavor of the Second Circuit's decision. Uh, so um, we have a wonderful panel here today, and I'm going to kind of whip through our speakers with some initial questions, um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to have more of a conversation. Um, so I'd like to begin um, on my right with Andy Gass, who is at Latham and Watkins, and who is counsel for the petition, um, the Andy Warhol Foundation. Um, Andy, your brief argued that the Second Circuit erred in focusing on the degree of visual similarity between the two works, rather than focusing on whether the Andy Warhol works convey a new meaning or message. Um, can you tell us more about um, what your concerns are with the Second Circuit's um, ruling? Sure, and I'll start by saying thanks so much to American University and for, for all of you for being here and, and to, the, the, to, for hosting me. So um, you set up the case quite well. I just wanna talk a little bit more about some of the record evidence um, before we get to your question about meaning or message. So the, the, what the, the record was in the district court was that um, Goldsmith herself testified that when she created the Prince uh, photograph, what she intended to communicate was sentiment about Prince the human. And she attempted to capture him as he really was at a particular moment in time, it was 1981. He hadn't quite achieved megastardom yet. And she perceived that he was sort of struggling with the the early trappings of fame and sought to sort of capture that discomfort. The Warhol work, by contrast, uh, consistent with the, the, the style for which Warhol has been and, and later came to be known, um, according to the record in the case, was principally communicating not a sentiment about Prince, the individual and his frailty, but rather uh, a message about sort of the dehumanizing effects of the celebrity status that Prince had attained in 1984. Um, and the, the, the work was commissioned to accompany an article called Purple Fame that was precisely about Prince's sort of ascendancy to the status of megastar. So when the second, the, when the district court looked at the two works at issue, the analysis on the first fair use factor said essentially, I understand the test that the Supreme Court prescribed in Campbell versus Acuff Rose back in 1994 to be, does work B, the follow on work at issue, imbue work A with a new and distinct meaning or message? And that's gonna be the critical 
question to determine whether B is transformative as that phrase has come to be used under copyright doctrine. And the district court's answer was yes, because that kind of different meaning or message that I just articulated, which I think those of you who listened to the argument this morning also heard the Chief Justice articulate, um, kind of matters in the first fair use analysis. And that may not be all that matters, but it matters. <laughs> and you need to take account of it when you're thinking about which way the first factor goes. The Second Circuit reversed and said a lot of things, one of which I think it's fair to characterize as courts shouldn't be in the business of assessing meaning or message at that level of granularity. These are two portraits of prints, they're works of visual art, the one took from the other and looks a lot like the other. We don't want judges in the business of ascertaining more subtle meaning or message than that. So we read that decision. I, I came on board uh, representing the Warhol Foundation after the Second Circuit's decision had been rendered. And it just struck us that meaning or message either is the most important thing that matters under Campbell versus Acuff Rose, or it is a forbidden subject of inquiry under the Second Circuit's test. And so we asked the Supreme Court to tell us which it is. Great, wonderful. All right, I'm gonna uh, turn to one of our online speakers now. Um, Josh Simmons is at Kirkland and Ellis. And uh, Josh was on the amicus brief on behalf of the Association of American Publishers. Um, and Josh, I'd like you to address something that you um, discuss in your brief and that was much discussed in the oral argument this morning. And that is um, the petitioner's concern um, about drawing lines between what is transformative fair use and what is within the derivative rights of the copyright holder. Well, I'm happy to do that. And thank you, Christine, for inviting me. And it's great to be um, on such an illustrious panel. I have behind me some of the photos from the case. I didn't have time. If you watch the argument, you know, or listen to the argument, you know that there was a whole discussion of putting uh, the Prince photographs on a Syracuse poster. And I was thinking to myself, I should get that in the background, but I didn't have time to put that together. <laughs> um, you know, from my perspective, um, and I think what you what our brief articulated is, our question is where does this fair use uh, transformative use test end? Um, we know copyright protection is intended to uh, promote new works and it does that and, and that's great. And the derivative work right is an important part of that, not just because of the creation of the original work and I think the original author is critically important, but because of licensing markets. And we know that that works because we've got a lot of them and a lot of works that are licensed and are created because of licensing. And we know that in this case, because uh, Prince or, uh, Andy Warhol was licensed, the original uh, uh, image was a licensed work. Um, so there's a concern here that if you have transformative use go too broadly, um, that'll gobble up all of those good policy rationales for having it. Now, I recognize that fair use has a role to play in, in that analysis, but you know, I thought the Second Circuit's opinion below did a nice job of trying to draw those lines. It said, you know, if you're trying to comment on or relate back to the original work, that can be a transformative use. And if you're not doing that, then you have to have some kind of different artistic purpose that goes beyond that and that you know, has a new meaning or message in that way. Um, I thought that was a good test and it's calculated to work, um, to think about things from an objective point of view. It was interesting hearing Andy, my good friend um, and colleague who um, want to talk about the subjective, the deposition testimony. And that is oftentimes as litigators, what we look to, but we've seen in case after case that the courts get uncomfortable with that. We don't want to run into the Blystein problem of courts becoming art critics, and we don't want to run into the problem of um, after the fact rationalizations by either party. The courts have eschewed that, and it's interesting because in the Carew v. Prince case that this case sort of um, is tied up and wound, wound into, maybe we'll get to later, that uh, copyright defendant didn't have his deposition. He said, I don't have any additional purpose, and the court said, well, we don't we need to worry about that because we're doing an objective test. So. I think today we heard some of the judge, the uh, justices really trying to figure out where is that line drawing. You heard Justices Jackson and Thomas saying, well, maybe purpose 
and character, which is the first factor, each do different work. Maybe the purpose is one part of what the Second Circuit's talking about and character is another. Um, you heard them being very concerned about, you know, where the line is drawn. I, Justice Barrett had an interesting uh, colloquy with um, Andy's colleague about, okay, well, if meaning and message is the test, it sounds like you're pushing a lot of the work to factor four because most things, including um, you know, transforming a book into a movie or what have you, are going to have some new meaning or some new message. And so you'd basically be saying, oh, it's transformative. And then let's see what the licensing market is. And that's just not how we've done this historically. So I think there was some concern there. Um, the one thing from the perspective of our brief that I was gladdened to hear is everyone seemed to agree that turning a book into a movie was not transformative. Um, we heard that from uh, Andy Warhol's Foundation's counsel, certainly from Goldsmith's counsel, and even the court, I think, agreed that that can't be transformative, that cannot be the, a test, cannot be one that gets you there. Um, and so that, I think, puts us in a pickle, because I don't think anyone, um, uh, I don't think that, that the meaning or message test gets you to that answer. I think Goldsmith's test would. Um, I think the government's test makes me very... Uh, sort of interested and concerned, they added to the Goldsmith test this concept of usefulness. And I don't know what that exactly meant. You saw the justice is a little concerned about it, but um, I think necessity and the Second Circuit's view um, draws that line. So let me stop there. Uh, Christina, maybe we can come back to this as we talk throughout the, the afternoon. Great. Great, thank you very much. All right, um, now I'm going to turn to my immediate right. Um, Rebecca Tushnet is a, a professor at Harvard Law School, um, and she wrote a brief on behalf of copyright law professors. And Rebecca, I'd like you to talk about, um, uh, we're, we've, we've been talking about new message and meaning um, in the alternative, let's do a side by side, let's look at similarity. Um, and I mentioned that the Second Circuit found that the two works were substantially similar as a matter of law. Um, so how much work is substantially similarity doing here? Right, so um, I should start by saying that uh, one of the reasons that people think fair use is too overstuffed is that it has become overstuffed by handling a whole bunch of cases that should be substantial similarity cases. So. Uh, uh, one of the unfortunate trends, uh, and, and it's and fair use sort of invites it because you consider similarity as part of the test, uh, but that invites uh, judges uh, to actually sort of throw it into the mix without ever deciding, okay, was what was taken enough to infringe in the first place? And that has strained fair use doctrine to be sure, but we could actually do better by saying no, substantial similarity should be, mean substantial. And the Second Circuit decision is a really good example of why uh, having fair use alone is actually not that great because the standard they use is, well, is it recognizable? But that's what's required for substantial similarity, right? So that like, so, so if being recognizable weighs heavily against fair use, then you know, fair use loses its ability to handle a lot of situations that we that it probably should. And so here's a question that I just asked my students and they struggled mightily with it. If, uh, is, is the phrase, you know nothing, Jon Snow, substantially similar to get the Game of Thrones? Because you recognize it. And if you look at the case, the current case law, about substantial similarity, you see the language that the that the Second Circuit used. If it's it's not de minimis, if it's recognizable, you know, it's a substantial amount if it's recognizable. But you know, nothing, Jon Snow is very very recognizable, right? And uh, something I hope that most of you will feel uncomfortable with the idea that that you know nothing, Jon Snow is substantially similar to the Game of Thrones. So that suggests there's something has gone wrong early in the process of figuring out what we really want copyright to cover. So once that's gone wrong, it's not surprising that the remaining doctrines end up straining and, uh, and, and you know, possibly buckling under that strain. So uh, I, I, from my perspective, the oral argument did not focus on any of the kind of underlying problems that got us here, not super surprising, a little disappointing, uh, but um, 
So I, I, I really wish that we'd had that discussion because um, it is true. It's, it's hard to get a coherent doctrine like to do cleanup when you know, your initial doctrine of infringement isn't working, which is the fundamental problem. Um, so I have lots of things to say, including about objectivity, but okay. I know we have lots of people. <laughs> Great, wonderful. All right, um, I'm going to turn to another online speaker. Our next speaker is Naomi Gray, who is at the law firm Shades of Gray Law Group. Um, and Naomi uh, filed a brief uh, uh, on behalf of the Digital Media Licensing Association. Um, Naomi, we've been talking, uh, and the court uh, and the, the argument this morning was mostly focused on the first factor, um, but there were questions, as uh, Josh has already alluded to, about the role of the fourth factor. And your brief in particular makes a connection between the fourth and factor. Uh, the first and fourth factor. So I'd like you to talk about that, please. Sure. Thank you so much, Professor Farley, and thank you to Washington College of Law for having me. So, um, you know, the question is, like, what is the role, really, that, that transformativeness and the first factor should have in relationship to the fourth factor? And I think, um, you know, what we try to emphasize in our brief for DMLA um, is that we should be looking at the relationship between the first factor and the fourth factor, giving the fourth factor the intended role that it had as first expressed by the Supreme Court in Harper and Roe versus Nation Enterprises. Recall that that was a case where the Nation magazine scooped the publication of President Ford's memoir and published juicy excerpts before the book came out. Um, and the Supreme Court held that that was not a fair use. Um, and in reaching that conclusion, um, the Supreme Court said that the fourth factor is, quote, undoubtedly the single most important element of fair use. And what has happened since that case came out in 1985 is that there has been a gradual erosion of the fourth factor by transformativeness in the first factor. And this started um, with Campbell when transformativeness was adopted as a measure of uses considered to be fair under the first factor. Um, and I'm not beefing with Campbell or with transformativeness here. Um, however, when I'm asked to do uh, public speaking on the subject of fair use, I always refer to transformativeness as the blob that ate fair use. And I used to say, you know, that the reason it has become the blob that ate fair use is because if a litigant can make a straight faced argument in favor of transformativeness, they're like 80% of the way to a determination of fair use. And I always used to say that, and it turns out I was actually wrong only in that my offhand percentage underestimated the significance of a transformative use finding. In fact, an empirical study by Professor Liu at USF Law School published in the Stanford Technology Law Review in 2019 found that a determination of transformativeness led to a finding of fair use 94% of the time. Um, this evolution in transformativeness has been incremental over time, but now it's become like a super factor. And we've di sharply diverged from what was envisioned in Harper and Rowe and in Campbell. And it's instructive to go back and look at those opinions. In Harper and Rowe, at the end of the sentence that I quoted a couple minutes ago about how the fourth factor is the most important, the court dropped a footnote emphasizing that there is a fully functioning market that encourages the creation and dissemination of memoirs of public figures. And that, in fact, is the situation that we have here. And that's what um, DMLA, that's the point that DMLA wanted to make in its brief. Um, and that is that there is a robust market that has been exist in existence for a long time for licensing photographs to serve as artist's reference for the creation of derivative works. And it's ironic because this case stems directly from an initial license from Goldsmith to Vanity Fair to use her photograph as an artist's reference. This market has been around for a long time. The initial license in this case issued so long ago, in fact, that when the Vanity Fair article came out, I was too young to have a driver's license, um, a time that my mm -hmm. teenager would characterize as roughly in the Pleistocene era. Um, more recently, in a survey that DMLA did of its membership, 85% of respondents said that they licensed content for the purpose of artist reference. So we're beginning to see lower courts shift back towards a more appropriate degree of consideration of the fourth factor. These courts recognize 
that the danger of overreaching with transformativeness is especially great with respect to copyright owners' derivative work rights. This is because derivative works transform the underlying work in a technical sense. They often, um, although not always, change the form of the work but they don't always serve the transformative purpose of fair use. And I was really glad to hear the government make this point so clearly at oral argument this morning. The government emphasized that while the concept of transformation is in the definition of a derivative work, by contrast in the fair use context, transformativeness originates from Judge Laval's article. They aren't the same thing. They don't mean the same thing. And she said, you would never want a reading of fair use that would eviscerate derivative works. The district court in this case overlooked this, conflating the market for the original photograph with the market for the creation of derivative works based on the original photograph. The district court kind of blew off the fact that Goldsmith hadn't licensed any of her original prints photographs, except of course, for the very use at issue here, which proves the existence of a market that she has exploited. But transformativeness isn't the end of the inquiry. Even Campbell recognized that a transformative use might interfere with the market for the original or a derivative of the original. In fact, after holding that the two live crew rap version of Pretty Woman was, trans was a transformative parody, it remanded for consideration of the fourth factor. But transformativeness isn't the end of the inquiry here either. There's a robust market at issue here to license photos to create derivative works generally and for photos to serve as artists reference specifically. The Second Circuit's opinion appropriately recognized this and that's why the fourth factor is so important here. Great, thank you, Naomi. All right, I'm gonna turn now um, to um, my left and hear from Pam Samuelson, who is a law professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley Law School. And she filed a brief on behalf of the Authors Alliance. Um, Pam, you've been doing research on the role that the Solicitor General plays in IP cases. Um, and as Naomi just mentioned, we heard from um, the Solicitor General's office this morning. And I wonder uh, how what you see happening in this case might fit into your research or what, what ideas you have about um, uh, the, the arguments made this morning. Yeah, so the Solicitor General um, uh, has uh, appeared in uh, every uh, case um, uh, except Allen versus uh, Cooper um, in the 21st century. Uh, and that by itself is actually pretty interesting um, because they didn't play uh, much of a role um, in the 20th century cases. Uh, so they only filed briefs in two of the 12 cases um, uh, that were pending in the 20th, uh, 20th century, but they file in all but two actually now. Um, and so I was really curious to see whether they would file in this case, because frankly, I don't see a federal interest uh, in this case in the way that there has been um, in many other cases. Um, so of course, I was like really interested in the Solicitor General's uh, brief. Uh, and. I'm not gonna talk about right now uh, my Authors Alliance brief. Uh, I hope to come back to that during the Q and A part. Uh, but what's striking to me was that the Solicitor General's brief, which um, uh, had six copyright office lawyers on it, uh, basically uh, uh, tried to develop a theory for a Solomonic compromise. So that the creation of the of the Warhol works from the photograph were was not at issue, uh, said the Solicitor General in this case, even though that's what the parties think that they're fighting about. Um, and that the only thing is whether or not this one particular commercial license of the orange one for the, the cover of the van of the of the of the Condé Nast um, a special issue, whether that was fair use. And there's nothing transformative, they say, about the, the use of the existing image uh, in the, on the cover, uh, and therefore it's not fair use. Now, okay, from the standpoint of the World Health Foundation, you gotta say, because that means that I, I own a copyright in those works um, and, the, um, and I can sell them under 109A and I can publicly display them under 109C. Um, 
And the Second Circuit seemed to think, and so did the Solicitor General, that there might be some commercial uses that would be okay uh, of these uh, of these works. Um, but it's uh, part of what's interesting about it is that it's it's a different Solomonic compromise than the Second Circuit tried to do. Second Circuit said, not a transformative fair use probably an infringing derivative, but we don't have to issue an injunction and she just wants compensation. So um, that's actually um, uh, all we're gonna give her when the case goes back down to the, the trial court. Now, the problem with that is if it's a, an infringing derivative, section 103A basically means that there's no copyright it means that all of the uh, prints of prints are actually infringing and that you can't publicly display them and you can't sell them and you can't license them. And in fact, it would have no, the Warhol Foundation would have zero copyright in, uh, in anything. And so the, you know, this, that was the second circuit, but they never even addressed the section uh, 103A issue. And it seems to me that that's a critical fact uh, about the case. And um, I will uh, just say uh, one more uh, thing, which is that I've been really interested that very little attention has been paid to the fact that Vanity Fair commissioned Warhol gave them the, the, the photograph and said, create a work of art, okay? So that to me looks like it's an authorized derivative. And at page 37 of the, uh, of the Goldsmith brief, she said, well, if they were created simultaneously and it was under the, the, the license, then maybe they're all uh, you know, lawful. And I'm going, Whoa! Um, I, that's not consistent with what you said in your complaint in the counterclaim, but then there's that. Okay, great, thank you, Pam. Um, all right, I'm going to turn again to an online speaker. Um, Latif Matima is a law professor at Howard Law School, um, and he filed a brief uh, on behalf of his Institute for IP and Social Justice and Intellectual Property Professors. And Latif, I'd like to ask you a question based on um, your institute, which is dedicated to um, finding um, an IP policy that promotes social justice and racial equity. And I'm wondering from that perspective, what you saw in this case that attracted your interest. Thank you everyone at, um, at uh, all my good friends at American for uh, inviting me to participate in this important uh, uh, conversation. What interest, interested us in this uh, dispute uh, it has to do with the possible uh, implications of a decision that would allow uh, this type of unauthorized acting on a, uh, a pre-existing work, <clears throat> the implications that that could have for um, unknown artists, marginalized artists, small artists, and I think that the, this morning there was a point in oral argument that in some ways sort of captured, captured this concern. I, I think it was Justice Kagan who was referring to uh, Andy Warhol. And the phrase was something like, you know, he transformed uh, how we think about art in, in the 20th century. And it was almost as if it, uh, the, the, the comment made me feel as, as, as if what was being said was that Andy Warhol is transformation personified, right? And so that um, to Warhol a work, right? To Warhol a pre-existing work, to make that a verb, right? Is to presumptively imbue it with new creativity, new meaning, new message, new transformation. <clears throat> and the danger of that, of this sort of uh, presumption that this well-known famous artist, he did it before and thus anything he comes near um, is going to be uh, transformed. Um, <clears throat> there is, as other speakers have, have, have addressed, the dangers of that to all pre-existing uh, artists um, uh, is, is, is somewhat apparent. Right, but our concern was particularly for 
the artists that are marginalized, the artists that are not in the mainstream. Because in cases like that, what you could have is when the uh, uh, well-known, well-established, elite recognized uh, majority artists um, uh, Warhol's a uh, pre-existing work. And the presumption is that that in and as itself uh, always will imbue it with new creativity, no matter how minimal the action upon the underlying work happens to be, uh, particularly in the cases of artists and uh, art forms that are not well known, okay, because they are from marginalized communities, unknown artists who are themselves being re revolutionary. Uh, <clears throat> when the public now is first introduced to this work with this uh, Warhol effect, the presumption is that any creativity that we see in it flows from <clears throat> the Warholization, if you would, of the work. And, and that may be primarily because the public is unfamiliar with the pre-existing art form. The, the, the public has never had a chance to engage with the work of these marginalized, lesser known, minor, if you would, artists. And in some cases, what actually may be happening may indeed be the reverse. It may be that the reason that people are reacting to the Warholized work as something new and fantastic and engaging and transformative, it may be that what they're really reacting to are these new and strange and different and never before seen creative contributions of the underlying marginalized artists, right? Which is in fact, perhaps that may be imbuing <coughs> the Warholized technique with the new meaning and uh, 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 the new uh, creativity. But of course, not being familiar with the pre-existing work, all of the credit, all of the attribution, all of the reward goes to the well-known established artists, not for having actually added anything, not for actually having transform uh, the work in the copyright sense of the word, but actually for simply misappropriating the creative contribution of the underlying but marginalized but unknown artists. And so that was our primary concern, that to avoid that sort of, of a result, that we need to have at least some sort of a floor uh, before we can uh, go down the assessing whether or not this is a uh, transformative use road, that uh, the, 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 the established artist or the secondary artist needs to do something more than what would be merely trivial um, in these cases in which it is an aesthetic to aesthetic reuse, a work that is aesthetic in the first instance and now being purportedly utilized for another aesthetic purpose. And that without some sort of a floor, which we don't believe uh, the floor was met in this case, without some sort of a floor, then we would run the risk of the kind of elite majority well-known artists easily misappropriating the creative contributions of the prior, but marginalized, but unknown artists. So I'll stop there for now. All right, thank you, Latif. All right, I'm going to turn now to our next speaker who is Amy Adler, who is a law professor at NYU Law School. Um, and she filed a brief on behalf of art law professors. And Amy, the question I'd, I'd love for you to address, um, I think follows on quite nicely, um, to what Latif just talked about. Um, 
So the Second Circuit, and, and this was quoted a couple of times by the justices in the argument this morning, the Second Circuit said judges shouldn't be art critics. Um, and I wonder um, you know, whether it's possible to not make an aesthetic determination uh, in a case like this. Um, this seemed to be kind of behind a lot of the questions, but not brought right out in the open. And um, in particular, I wonder about the relationship between making an aesthetic determination and kind of uh, free expression. Thanks so much. Um, I think that um, to begin with the Second Circuit and its opinion below, while disavowing the, you know, the possibility of it playing art critic and specifically warning against this Bleistein problem, judges should not play the role of art critic, went right ahead and did so. And it did so by saying, we're not gonna be art critics. We're just gonna look at these things side by side. We'll just take a look at them. Oh, these look like each other. It's recognizably deriving from, oh, this is the style of, this is just style. Oh, you know, and so on and so forth. So um, no art critic problem here, no Bleistein problem here, just obviously not fair use. And that to me um, was a huge mistake and one that I hope, um, the Supreme Court helps um, will avoid as it goes about making what I think will be, you know, a, a, an important an important decision. Um, I guess another thing, and this goes to your First Amendment question, um, there was a lot of discussion today in oral arguments about um, the role that meaning and message should play. I think it, at the Second Circuit level, it seemed to be playing no role if the works looked alike. Um, but even here, there were questions. How much is it just subsumed by an inquiry into purpose? Does it inform the inquiry into purpose and so forth? The, the point I wanna make is that if we uh, don't pay careful attention to the meaning and message inquiry, we will violate the um, first amendment role that fair use is meant to play because the meaning and message of a work of art is precisely what gives it expressive value. And courts can't protect the expressive value of works without some inquiry into that. Now, we know um, the Supreme Court has told us that fair use is meant to be a First Amendment safeguard. And I think it's that meaning and message portion of the test and that uh, that first prong of the test, which, which um, the first factor of the test, um, which allows that First Amendment inquiry to be satisfied and to, to avoid it would, I think, eviscerate the First Amendment function that fair use is meant to play. Um, another point I, I want to make, and this goes back to the, these things look alike, so everything's fine. Um, things that look alike can really mean very different things. And um, one has to accept this, uh, maybe not in all realms, but this is essential to understanding um, how artworks produce meaning. Um, and Warhol in this case is, you know, someone who really um, helps us see this. And I, you know, I, I um, Warhol, you, you know, there's this acontextual understanding of Warhol going on in certainly the Second Circuit decision and a lot of other uh, aspects of the argument today, I also saw this where there's this idea that um, Warhol was just a style, um, not understanding that Warhol was a radical transformation in the history of art um, and really raised questions about what art could mean. I will say, you know, there was so much discussion today about um, sitcoms and Syracuse teams, which, you know, all of this very funny and, and charming and Mork and Mindy and all of that, but there was very, very little discussion of art. And I think the reason Warhol matters is not because he's famous. Um, it just so happens that because he's so famous, because he did make such an important um, shift in the history of art, that we just happen to know a lot about what his work means. But if we can't protect Warhol, about whom volumes have been written about the, you know, his meaning and message, and how he changed the course of art. This is the kind of work, of course, copyright is meant to protect, you know, a paragon of creativity. If we can't protect him, then who can we protect? I think, you know, I think um, Warhol was once an unrecognized artist. And so protecting Warhol, um, certainly the last thing we want to do is give a privilege to 
famous artist. But on the other hand, we cannot deny that we know a lot about Warhol. And one thing he did, he may not have been the paragon of a transformative artist, but he was the paragon of a meaning and message artist. He has been called, even more than an artist, a philosopher of art. And um, I'll stop there. Lots more to say, but I can't wait to hear what everyone else has to say. So our last panelist is Andrew Kim, who is a 2012 graduate of this law school and who is at Goodwin Proctor and um, filed a brief on behalf of, you know, Amy filed a brief on behalf of art law professors who are way cool. Um, but Andrew's uh, group of clients include the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, the Roy Lichtenstein Foundation, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, the Brooklyn Museum, and the College Art Association. Um, and there was a lot of art in your brief. Um, and I wanted to ask you about um, some of the uh, discussions. There was a reference to uh, Jeff Koons in the argument today um, and where it would leave appropriation artists um, if the fair use test was um, changed in some of the ways that the solicitor general or the uh, respondents um, asked for. Uh, thank you, Professor Farley. And uh, uh, thank you to American University for having me here. It's great to be back as an alum, great to be back at this program. And uh, for those keeping score, I did speak on behalf of Oracle last year. So if you'd like to call me out on that, I'll see you at the reception afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I think to answer the question, I think it leaves the per those, if you start from the premise that there's nothing that's truly original, right? I think even just a story observed that you know, 200 years ago, and that in order to create something new, you have to build up something that already exists. I think this is incredibly troubling for those who appropriate elements of different artworks into their own to create a new message, a new expression for themselves. And I, you know, I, I focus on various parts of the argument, but I like to focus on something that Lisa Blatt, who represented uh, Goldsmith, said. She said, we're actually okay with anything other than the new meaning or message test. So what does that leave you with, right? Mm -hmm. They want to create this test of purpose or character. The government and um, Goldsmith had suggested necessary, indispensable, essential has to be part of it. And also the government had suggested highly useful. Well, what does that mean? Plus, you know, there was this added element of justifying uh, the, the use, the, the copying, which places an enormous burden on someone who's relying on what should be, as Professor Adler pointed out, uh, a, a, an extension of free expression, right? To protect speech, to be able to create new and uh, innovative thoughts. So I think, I think what's troubling here is that if you look at Manet's Olympia on the left, that didn't come from any, just out of thin air. Manet was harking back to earlier traditions of Renaissance artists, Giorgione, Titian, and they, you know, those artists portrayed, you know, these elegant, uh, noble women who are lying in, in, in splendor. And here, Manet is taking the same concept and, you know, one, criticizing the, the, um, the conservative classical establishment, but also, uh, that's a wide zoom. Uh, <laughs> But also, also um, commenting that there can be found beauty found in, in ordinary Parisian life. And then you look at the, the work on the right, which we didn't sign in our brief, but I thought was particularly astounding. It's a commentary about, not about Manet per se, but our perception of the work based on the role reversals of those of the person of color and the prostitute in Manet's original and how we perceive the value of the work and the, the, the roles that these individuals play if the picture was altered in this fashion. That's not a commentary on Manet per se, which is the, the standard I think that some would propose under, based on today's argument, but it is a commentary. And it, but if you, if you take it on a broad level of generality, I think Justice Sotomayor had a, a trouble with this. Um, what is the purpose? Is there a different purpose? They're both commentary. They're both uh, artistic works. How do you draw the lines of fair use? Are you saying that the second work, could, I mean, set aside the time differential and copyright expiration and all that, but you know, assume that these works are created close in time. Are you saying the work on the right isn't worthy of pre, uh, protection and uh, uh, isn't a new expression, isn't a new creative work that it deserves to be out there? That's troubling. And so you know, Naomi had mentioned earlier that fair use has become this blob. 
maybe it has to be a blob. And sometimes it has to be the identical work in order for that expression or message to be made. You have the Brillo box on the left, which is you know, the commentary on commercialism by Warhol. And then Charles Lutz was an appropriation artist who, um, who took Warhol's works, created fakes of them, submitted them to the Warhol Authentication Board. And if I get you in trouble with your client, sorry about that, but you know, <laughs> submitted these to the uh, Warhol Authentication Board and got them stamped denied. He created a series of works called Warhol Denied which is a work with series of works that were intended to spur the question of what is a Warhol and who gets to decide that? It's not a commentary about the Brillo piece to begin with, but it is a commentary. And if you strip out the expression or message aspect of it and say, what is the purpose? Still an artistic work, still a commentary, still a Brillo box that's meant to be social commentary. What are you left with but message and expression? And if you don't have that as a the line to draw and that um, Goldsmith, I think, is advocating to strip out. And by the way, that comes from Campbell. It didn't come out of thin air. But if you strip out expression, what are you left with? And do we not get this anymore? Thank you, Andrew. All right. Um, so um, I would like to open it up to the panelists to um, first and foremost, respond to anything that you've heard someone else say, but I know a lot of you said, I have other points I want to make, so give you a little <laughs> opportunity to do that. Um, but if you could please be brief one or two minutes um, so that we uh, have time um, for other, other stuff. I would love to ask Andy a question based on something that um, Pam and Amy had raised in their uh, sort of comments, if that's okay. Um, and that was in both uh, Pam and Amy's comments, they were talking about the concern about the original works, the original paintings that existed versus the sort of licensed work. And that seemed to bother the court too. Um, Pam was talking about, you know, oh, you know, they, they, they didn't, they're not seeking an injunction. You know, maybe these were, maybe the original works were licensed and, um, and the like. And Amy's concern was about the creation of those original works. Um, and then one of the things I heard at oral argument was, and I think Pam raised this too, you know, if the if those were infringements, then Prince wouldn't hold a copyright because 103A says that they're infringements, they're 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 um Sadly, they're Prince not a copyright anyway, being Warhol. <laughs> or, yeah, those two are right. Warhol wouldn't own the copyrights. And I'm sort of curious if, about the tension between the those positions, where in one respect, Warhol is sort of, you know, is the alleged infringer. And yet we, even in oral argument, we started talking about sort of him as the copyright owner and his licensing strategy. And is there a tension there between those two things? Because I, I think from the Goldsmith side, they deal with this by saying, look, it's not about the original art. That's not the issue. It's just this licensing. And I don't know if we got to hear as much about from the Warhol Foundation side about, you know, the flip side of that, of those concerns. So I was just curious what, you know, what your thoughts were on that. Um, thanks, Josh, for teeing that up. Um, listen, I, I think I am genuinely baffled by the suggestion that there is a way to resolve this case or think about it by focusing on the licensing transaction and pretending that the original creation is not at issue. And we saw the US government try to attempt that maneuver we saw Lisa Blatt at argument attempt to suggest that, oh, maybe the 16 original creations uh, were somehow authorized under the license grant from Vanity Fair. That's simply not what this case is about. To the contrary, the original demand that Goldsmith made to Warhol was for a seven figure settlement and what she called ownership of the copyrights in the work and her counter complaint asserted a request for relief in the form of an order saying that the Warhol Foundation doesn't own a copyright in any of the works. So that, that is very fundamentally what this litigation is about. I think it's also, excuse me. Um, uh, it is um, absolutely uh, relevant, if not dispositive, of the questions about later uses of the Warhol originals, because I don't think that you can sensibly answer the question, is X use at time two of this work a fair use, where the work itself is clearly you know, different in some respect from the original, 
without having a perspective on the question whether the creation was a fair use. So Josh, I don't know how responsive that was to your specific question, but those are my sort of thoughts on the general, general topic. Great, thank you. I'm gonna to turn to you, Rebecca, because you were about to speak. So um, uh, I too could go on for a very long time. I will just say, uh, the, the, I wanted to say a word about the concept of necessity or essentiality mm -hmm. that uh, seemed to, so of course the problem is essential to what and and from whose perspective so i think of the you know food chain barbie case where mattel sues this photographer saying like why did you pick on barbie you didn't need to pick on barbie right and so the uh, and i think the court sort of saw saw that that was going to be a problem and so then the 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 position that you back into as well it was essential to do what i wanted to do but what i wanted to do was talk about barbie right like uh, and uh, so it, it creates a regression problem that uh, that is much better dealt with as a spectrum right so so i think everyone intuitively grasps that the more the original is the target Right, the easier it should be to make out a fair use, but that doesn't mean that if the or if the original is uh, not a target, it can't be a fair use. Moreover, the and and the the thing that gives people trouble when you have like an essentiality standard is, well, I picked an exemplar, right? I didn't need to pick this one. There are other uh, there are other things, but they all fit into the set of things I wanted to talk about. So none of them was necessary, but each one of them was appropriate. And so I, I, I really hope, uh, as, as Sarah Burstein already pointed out, we already have uh, the word useful in copyright law. It's giving us enough, enough trouble where it is, right? Uh, we, let's, let's not make this worse. Um, and, and I guess the other thing that I thought, you know, again, we, we just, we don't have good language to talk about this within law, although I think aesthetic theory does, uh, which is that uh, like, there is, we have to figure out a way to grab, to resolve whatever you think about these photos compared to what you think about parody, right? So what is it, so at least, you know, Lisa Blatt purports to accept, you know, Campbell, oh, parody is fine. So what is it that, that matters? And when I, when you say you have to target Right. Do you have to target something that's unique to this work? Is that the only justification? That seems weird. And the government talking about book reviews seems to recognize that. Like, you don't have to write a book review of any particular book, but, you know, I've decided to write about this one. So I get to quote from it. So uh, uh, I, I think that's why the court's ultimately going to find it very difficult to impose a standard that will be of essentiality or that, that will actually do any useful work. Useful work. Yes. Useful work. I guess my question from that perspective is doesn't the Second Circuit's test get you there? Because the Second Circuit said there's a relation back requirement. So that would de deal with your direct need to parody or to comment or, or whatever. And then there's the second prong that says if you don't have that need, then it has to be somewhat more different because then you don't have that justification and you're then treading onto the derivative work right. It seems like that the second circuit there actually gave actually, you out to deal with both of the two issues that Rebecca raised. There isn't actually one test articulated in the Second Circuit decision. There are four of them that I can count. Um, and uh, I don't know whether distinct artistic purpose, uh, fundamentally new and different, um, uh, is required. Um, I don't know whether it's overall purpose and function uh, or, or uh, recognizably similar. Yeah. Um, uh, they're all in there. And that will sh throw everything into chaos. I have to say that the Authors Alliance brief uh, really focuses on, I can't even tell what this means, okay? Um, and one of the things that Authors Alliance does is it provides guides and guidance about when can you make fair uses and when do you need to uh, clear rights. We have guides written on both of those subjects and they were based on the Campbell versus Ake of Rose and the progeny uh, cases where new meaning or message is at least a very significant criterion. And 
maybe it's not the only thing. Um, one of the things that, that our brief talks about is that um, uh, the new meaning or message is one of the criteria to distinguish derivative works from fair uses. Um, another criterion is how much transformative, right? Is it highly transformative or is it modestly transformative? And the more transformative it is, um, the, the, the Second Circuit decision says all or nothing. It's either like transformative under my kind of four different theories or it's not transformative. Um, and I'm not gonna say that there's any degree of transformativeness here. Um, and that's just baloney, okay? So our, our brief basically shows that the, the case law looks at that as a part of distinguishing uh, the two types of things. Um, and uh, again, maybe the second circuit was right that the trial court gave too much attention to, to transformative and it was like reacting to that, but it was actually supposed to follow Supreme Court case law and it didn't. Um, and so from my standpoint, that second circuit decision has got to go. So, uh, can I, can I just, okay, sorry. So um, I too don't see the second circuit opinion as, as explaining what it means to, to uh, so I don't see actually a requirement that you target the original, although I guess you can infer that to the extent that the Second Circuit thinks that it's not under ruling Campbell, it, it, it must continue to provide for parity. So it must have some sort of targeting in, in mind. But the, the, like the question is targeting what? Like, uh, I think the oral argument, the end of the oral rebuttal did this very well. Like, okay, the target is, I, need, I wanted a picture of Prince. Like I wanted to say something uh, about Prince. And this is a picture of Prince. It was an exemplar, right? Um, and all the other exemplars would have had the same problem. Uh, that, that you know somebody has taken a picture, and uh, so so maybe you can infer that the Second Circuit wants some sort of commentary on the artistic style of the photographer that is something other than saying you know what we now know as photographic realism means one thing, and sort of non-photographic realism has a different effect on your perception. But like that's in the record that you know that's how people understood that's how audiences understood the Warholization to actually be a comment on the difference between ideal, you know, idealization and photographic realism. So like uh, on the record, like, okay, look, the Second Circuit obviously has buyer's remorse about carry you versus print. Uh, okay, fine. But this was not the case to uh, like, you can't, you can't undo carry you by ruling against war. And that's what they tried to do. All right, I'm going to go to Naomi and then Amy. Uh, thanks. Um, I, uh, I, I want to make a comment that sort of ties together a few different things that were said um, by a couple different people. Um, Amy said that Warhol was a really significant artist, right? That he changed what art means, that he was a philosopher of art. And if we can't protect him, we can't protect anyone, which I sort of think of as the do you know who I am argument, right? Um, and no one's saying that Warhol isn't an important artist or that he didn't do important things, but that's sort of not the point of fair use. Uh, fair use has been characterized by the Supreme Court as an equitable rule of reason. They use that language, I think, in both Sony and in Harper and Rowe. It's meant to permit uses that would technically be infringing, but serve overriding social goals, but importantly, without causing harm to the copyright owner, right? It still can't be something that interferes with the owner's ability to exploit its monopoly. And Andy said something about how sometimes a use, you know, a, a, you know, a secondary use, or as they've been saying in this case, a follow-on use, needs to use the exact underlying work. And fair use certainly allows that under appropriate um, circumstances. Think of, for example, the use of the Grateful Dead posters in a visual timeline of the history of the band in Dorlin Kindersley versus Bill Graham archives. Same work, but used for a very different purpose from the original. And as Professor Samuelson said, transformativeness isn't necessarily binary, right? Something can be not transformative, modestly transformative, highly transformative. But even if it's transformative, it can still interfere with the market for the original work. And that is where the problem comes in, even if you have something that's highly 
transformative. And you can sort of contrast that with the question, I think it was actually Justice Gorsuch who noted that one of the amicus briefs said that there was an ex that, that this case presented an existential threat to photographers and asked uh, the foundation's attorney to comment on that position. And he said, um, it doesn't present an existential threat because the transformation here, what I have in my notes anyway, is the transformation here is quote unquote too big. But to me, that's not at all clear uh, where you have the existence of a longstanding market, you know, dating back to when I used to ride cows to school in the Pleistocene era, um, you know, that photographers regularly exploit for um, just this kind of use that's involved in this case. Great, thank you, Naomi. Uh, Amy? Yes, I'm so glad to have a chance to respond to that because I really want to strenuously disagree with the characterization of what I'm saying as a oh, Warhol is it, you know, the, the defense is, do you know who I am? And I, I would find that repugnant. And I think we all should. I think rather um, a couple of things. First of all, um, it's this is not an argument that because he's Warhol, we're not gonna consider the other factors. In fact, it may very well be the case that if we can confine the facts of this case to the licensing context, which uh, uh, you know, I think there's reason to uh, sincerely doubt that. But, but Warhol, if, if it is just in the licensing context, I think the fourth factor points um, in a way that, you know, maybe towards Goldsmith. Um, there may be some arguments for Warhol, but it, at the end of the day, it may be Goldsmith's win, at least in this licensing context. However, it's not to know who I am. It's that the question in fair use, at least as we've known since Campbell, it, to, to incorporate the question of new meaning and message, transformative, is you know, is there a new meaning or message? And it just so happens because Warhol was so important and has been given so much scholarship that we actually have a lot of information about the new meaning and message that he brought to the work. Warhol is the quintessential artist where, where you can reduce, frankly, what he's saying to meaning without even going into to visuals. So it's not at all that he's like, uh, my point is not at all that he's a famous artist, but rather that it's so hard to understand what a work's meaning and message is, right? Do we look at the two pictures side by side? No, that's terrible. The Second Circuit was wrong about that. There are pitfalls in any way we go about it, but it just so happens with Warhol, we really have a lot of information about him and we should take that into account. And the Second Circuit refused to consider any of it. It refused to consider art critics. It did an entirely acontextual side-by-side -side analysis asking about style. And that's, to me, uh, wrong as a matter of law, uh, if, we, if we think meaning and message still counts. All right, thank you, Amy. Uh, Andrew? Make this real quick, um, more of a thought to consider more, uh, rather than responding to anyone else, but... Um, one question that Justice Alito asked that sort of jumped out at me was, how are you going to prove whatever comes out of factor one, right? Um, do you submit evidence? Um, sometimes it's a side-by-side -side comparison. And I, I'd like to, for people to think about the fact that, like, this is costly litigation. This is very expensive. If you're going to be forced to go through a full trial or at least summary judgment through discovery to prove what your message was or your, your expression was, or your purpose or character was, artists, especially emerging artists, can't afford that. And so what, how, how can you create a test that's fair? And I think this is something that court will have to struggle with in the background. Whatever comes of factor one, how are you gonna create a test that's fair, that's, uh, that's fair to both the Warhols of the world and the unfound Warhols of the world? Um, and yet it's something more than just a judge looking at a work side by side saying, I know it when I see it, I'm gonna get in trouble with the con law and the copyright professor for saying that, but <laughs> looking at things side by side and saying, ah, I see a new purpose, I see a new character. And I think that's something the court will really have to struggle with, um, or it may not, I don't know, but I think it, it might come up, so. All right, Latif, I'm gonna give you the last word. Oh, uh-oh. Well, <laughs> so let me just quickly <laughs> say that I, I, I think that, you know, we, we all seem to agree that the test should not be, um, is the second comer famous and really well liked and do celebrities pay stupid amounts of money for their work, right? But I think we have to acknowledge that even though we think that should not be a part of the analysis, 
I think if you read the opinions, right, and if you hearken back to Cario, which I think uh, Rebecca is, is absolutely right, that's what the court, that's what the Second Circuit was trying to walk back here. And I think this is a good opportunity to walk back Cario, however you ultimately decide what you want to do with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with the Warhol. But I think that we can't ignore the fact that there is some of the, this guy is really famous, well-known for always doing you know, incredible things. There is some of that here in terms of some of the arguments in support of uh, 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 Warhol's uh, uh, use of the work. And I think that um, we, we, we have to acknowledge, we have to acknowledge that, I mean, heck, even Warhol could have had a bad day, right? I mean, there can be circumstances in which we would like to think that there was something substantive, i.e. transformative done. There can be uh, 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 circumstances in which, you know, this time that just didn't happen, right? And, and I, I agree that this, this is not the Cario case, right? This is not one in which I would say, okay, I can easily, or, or art critics can easily say that there was no new message, no new, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the way this case is decided Okay, and I think what the Second Circuit was trying to do was to draw that line, to just separate out those cases in which what we would inadvertently be doing is that, well, because Andy Warhol walked past this painting and somebody caught a photograph of him walking past it, that we're saying he has done something. I think those are the types of circumstances that the Second Circuit was trying to say, let's put those out, out of the frame, right? And I, I, I understand that we may not all agree that uh, on, on how the Second Circuit did it, but I think the Second Circuit, what they were trying to do, I think is, is, is necessary, um, both uh, to uh, famous and established artists, but most importantly, to lesser known artists. All right, thank you. All right, so we started 10 minutes late and I cannot spare 10 minutes. So I'm gonna steal 10 minutes from your future. You can leave, but it would be your loss if you do. Um, so two exciting things are gonna happen now. Um, the second exciting thing is that I'm gonna turn to you, the live audience and the online audience um, for questions that you can pose to our speakers. Um, but before that, um, I'm so delighted to be joined by my colleague, Peter Yazi who is very fitting um, to give the last word and some concluding thoughts on, on this case and maybe past Supreme Court fair use cases. Well, I'll be very, very quick. And thank you, Christine. And, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back at the law school. Um, having read the briefs and listened on the, on the recording today to the the argument, I must say that I'm, I'm on pins and needles as someone who has spent a lot of the last 25 years working more or less happily with creative people of various kinds, helping them to figure out what their fair use rights are and how to exercise them responsibly. You know, the, 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 a shadow has been cast across the future of this broadly successful new fair use doctrine that we've all taken advantage of since uh, Campbell against Age of Rose. And it's, it's a very different court. The courts have gotten itself into a difficult, they have gotten themselves up, up to and including the Supreme Court into a difficult situation here because they've taken cert on a case that has some, some very, very peculiar and difficult facts out of which emerged uh, out a, an innocuous but, but, but superficial district court opinion, which was then taken over by a Second Circuit uh, panel majority, which produced something which I would agree with Pam is really entirely incoherent. <laughs> and that's, that's scary in terms of what it opens up 
in the way of future possibilities. I think we are, we are at risk of losing something which has been of enormous value to more different kinds of cultural workers and creators, both obscure and famous, young and old, new and old, new, new and, and experienced over the last quarter century. So I would just urge, England's listening, I would urge the court in, oh, and then there was the other thing, and that is we didn't get to talk a lot about the argument, but it, it was very strange. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, your point about the, the computation of curious and substantial similarity I mean, how long did they talk about sitcom <laughs> spin-offs? I mean, it was just odd. I mean, it was just category confusion all the way down the line. So again, yeah. it's scary. Um, I would urge whoever's actually going to do the, the reasoning and writing on this case to think about the Supreme Court's own precedents, not just Campbell, which has been inordinately successful in almost every domain, uh, including, I would say, whatever we think of, of, of Carrie U, by and large, the domain of so-called appropriation part. I also urge the court to think a little bit about the case it decided last year, that is Google against Oracle, which answers, in Justice Breyer's opinion, in holding her dictum, many of the questions which are now being treated as being up for grabs, somehow difficult or, or, or obscure, including, of course, the relationship between the derivative use work and fair use, which is amply covered in the Oracle opinion, and including the, the content of the, the, the economic harm assessment in factor four, which Google against Oracle affirms is a consumer oriented inquiry, which has to do with risks of product substitute of cultural product substitution, and not simply with lost licensing opportunities. If lost licensing opportunities counted against a factor four analysis, we would have no fair use. The only reason we got it is because for the last 25 years, we've been able to, uh, to, to cabin off, to, to separate lost light, putative or notional lost licensing revenues from consumer substitution losses. That's all clear from Oracle against Google. We don't have to go over that ground again. Nor, and it's kind of interesting because there was some discussion earlier of the possibility that, that there might be super factors in play. If we really cared about super factors, well, Oracle against Google makes that clear too, because Oracle against Google declares a super factor in fair use analysis. In the language it follows, whether the copier's use fulfills the objective of copyright law to stimulate creativity for public illumination by adding something new and important. That's Justice Breyer's super factor. And I, I hope, I hope that this court, so soon after the, the conclusion of Justice Breyer's distinguished career on it, you know, while his seat is still warm, will not overlook what Google against Oracle teaches. That's wonderful. Thank you, Peter. From my listening of it, some of the points that seemed like the hardest points were, okay, we know that the relationship between the derivative work right and, and transformative use from a statutory perspective is easy enough to explain that the derivative work right is subject to fair use. But nonetheless, when you dig in, why, and Andy, maybe it's a question for you because you're, you're uh, you know, you folks were very quick to concede that a movie made from a book is is uh, is not fair use if, if in the normal commercial use. But 
uh, but didn't really want to answer the question of is it a transformative use, but just if there's harm to the market or not. Um, and, and so uh, when you were when you were pushed to say factor, are you saying that factor four is doing all the work in those cases? There was some discomfort and the questions were around that, but we didn't get to it. So if you guys could re reflect on the points in the argument that really stood out for you. And of course, if anyone's willing to make a prediction about how this comes out, <laughs> we, we're all hungry to hear. I'm going to take a lesson from Justice Gorsuch this morning uh, and, and answer your, your question, Professor Carroll. No. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot going on there, of course, but I, I think that the most straightforward analysis is that, of course, we'll want to know more, we'll want to look at the record, we'll want to understand what the works actually consist of, because that's what we do in copyright law, right? District court decisions are replete throughout the last God knows how many years, going back at least to Judge Hand in dissection and analysis of what's going on in case in work A versus work B. But subject to all of that, I think it's a pretty straightforward answer. Most of the time when you have an adaptation of a book to a movie, work B doesn't imbue work A with a new meaning or message in the relevant sense. And so you don't win factor one. In those cases where you do win factor one for some reason, most of the time you're going to have a big factor four problem. So we can sort of talk about that at whatever length folks are interested in, but that's the, the quick and dirty response. I think what Andy said is absolutely right. I think there has to be reliance on the original expression in order for it to be derivative. Like if you have to use the messages and build on that message, then it's no longer truly original. And this may not be Andy's point, but that's, this is sort of my view. This does not reflect the views of my clients, by the way. So this is my personal <laughs> uh, take on this. But I think there has to be reliance on the original expression in order for it to be derivative. You have to be you know, building on the universe that was already created in order for it to be uh, 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 derivative. Um, whereas I don't think you necessarily have that with transformation. So um, that I don't think will be a satisfactory way of drawing the line. If, that, if it were, I'd be... A, probably very rich, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that has something to do with it at the very least. Yes. Um, my question is, Rebecca, and kind of inquiring into the example that you had from the, the Game of Thrones. Now, to me, the, to me, my immediate thought was there was a big difference between recognizing a one-line quotation from an extremely voluminous work, whether you're talking about the show or the books. Um, but then, actually, that made me think about um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Tanya Applin and Lionel Bentley's book on global mandatory fair use, uh, interpreting 10.1 of Byrne uh, in this kind of expansive quotation, uh, you know, fair quotation. So I guess my question for you would, would be, can you and would you describe what Warhol did with the Goldsmith work as quotation? So I absolutely agree that there is like a conceptual difference here. And the, the problem is it doesn't show up in the cases at all, which has, it, which has made it impossible for courts to say, look, this just true, it's expression, it's just not enough. Despite the, 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 the theoretical presence of the word substantial and substantial similarity, it's been replaced with recognizable. And then the Second Circuit sort of uh, doubles down on that by also replacing substantial similarity of protectable expression with like recognizable in fair use factor three. So like, uh, so now fair use isn't even capable of, of, of handling this, right? Um, so I would not characterize, I mean, like quotation, I guess is, is analogous, but I, I would say that Warhol took from the photograph the underlying facts about how prints looked. So in some sense, it's not even a quotation, uh, like, uh, because it's not actually quoting the protectable expression, it's copying the stuff that she didn't create because, uh, because Warhol changed the angle, changed the cropping, changed the way the light worked because you know, the color blocking completely changes the, the effect. And those are the protectable parts of the photo. So you know, I think courts don't handle photos super well in general. Um, and I'm not sure the language of quotation would help handle that, but certainly focusing on, like, uh, on making substantial similarity substantial again. Uh, would would actually at least require us to to say okay what was it in the photo that ended up 
in the Warhol image. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly a big fan of the quotation, right? And I think it works as an analogy. I just think it'd be hard, it, court, courts would struggle, you know, applying it visually. Uh, we've got one from online, uh, uh, which is, does it matter that the Warhol piece doesn't seem like a commentary on Goldsmith, but uh, Goldsmith version of Prince, but on Prince himself? <laughs> But those are the same thing, right? Like, so this is, again, this is handling images badly, right? We have this idea that a photograph is like a transparent representation of the actual world. But of course, as Goldsmith's skill demonstrates, it is absolutely 100% not a transparent representation of the world. It is a presentation, a representation, uh, and it, it shows prints in a particular light, right? <laughs> Both factually and sort of metaphorically. And uh, this is the whole point about what she was trying to do to humanize him, uh, right? To, to, to show his vulnerability, to show him as a person. That's what a photographer can do. And that is a skill that is artistic. But once you recognize that, you can't just say, oh, uh, you know, the, uh, there's no commentary in changing this sort of, uh, I'm showing you what he's really like to, I am iconizing him. But I think to the, to the question um, that the online person was asking, I think if this had been a situation where you took the exact photograph and put it in a different context and really were commenting on the photograph, that would be a different case. We have situations where you can use a photograph in a different context to make a point about the, the photographer or even about the subject. Um, but that goes back to the dichotomy that I do think the Second Circuit was drawing between purposes um, that are directly related to the, the original work and purposes like this, where it's not really about the original work, it's about you know, what else are you doing? So I, you know, I don't have the same trouble uh, trouble that that uh, that uh, Pam or, or Rebecca have with the with the Second Circuit opinion, but I do think to the question, if you're actually criticizing the work directly, I think most of us would be more would think that's more likely to be transformative, you know, regardless of how this case is working out. Okay, there's a question in the back. I have two questions, one for each answer. Um, on uh, Mr. Gass, uh, is there any evidence in the record that the Warhol Foundation did enforcement on their copyright in the iconic Warhol image? The reason I ask, is, you know, my experience with artists is they want to borrow and borrow and borrow while they're still the struggling artist, and then they want to protect and protect and protect and protect the established artists. And for the other, Andrew, um, the Examples you showed before in your slides all seem to easily meet the relation back test, right? And so to me, we're distinguished, I think, from the questions here in the Warhol case. Those are two very different questions by Eddie Campbell. So I will quickly begin by transforming, by recontextualizing this question, <laughs> by, yes <or> no? <laughs> by, by, by outing the questioner as a client of mine who is probing my knowledge of the record in this case. Um, <laughs> the answer is no. The Warhol Foundation never enforced any copyrights in the print series, but it is also true that the Warhol Foundation plays both sides in this space very openly and proudly. It is on one hand, an organization that relies very heavily on copyright limitations to allow for the lawfulness of these works that have come to be canonical in the Western tradition, but didn't start out that way to, to Professor Adler's point. On the other hand, they are also a major licensor of Warhol's works. And so for that reason, they care a lot about getting the balance in this ecosystem right. So they, they really do not come to this from the perspective of an extremist on one side of the debate or the other. Uh, on, the, on the relation back question, I, I, think, I think I would maybe disagree with the notion that it necessarily relates back, but setting aside one, you know, one the incoherence of the Second Circuit's view, and two, um, I, I think I was meaning more to address the concepts that were coming out during argument today, which is to cabin uh, transformation or prong, uh, factor one with concepts of necessary, you know, uh, um, uh, highly useful, essential. Um, I think that's disturbing for, um, e even if you were to retain some semblance of the expression test, but then you, you add in concepts like necessary, highly useful. What about 
Well, I think that's I, I think that's a recipe for you know great litigation for people like us, but then you know uh, not great for artists because I think if you add usefulness to it, like who gets to decide what's useful? So I think that just compounds the problem. And at the end of the day, shouldn't fair use you know if the copyright protection and fair use both? I mean they're not distinct concepts, but like they're intertwined, obviously. But they're both designed in some way to protect uh, creativity, to protect expression. And if, if in doubt, shouldn't you err on the side of allowing for more expression, not less? I know it's it's hard. It, you, I mean, you, you point out with your earlier question about you know when you when you're the starving artist, you you know take 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 take, and then when you're the established artist, you protect 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 protect. But when in doubt, shouldn't the tie go to the person trying to create? I would argue, uh, Andrew, to the absolute contrary. I mean, because I think that to a certain extent, many of the arguments in support of, of Warhol beg the question to a certain degree. We're kind of always, we're kind of assuming that this is always gonna be about the tension between derivative work and transformation, but there's another kind of action upon a pre-existing work that doesn't rise to the level of a derivative work. And it's something that we oftentimes don't talk about. It's something that courts refer to as a non-literal copy, okay? And a non-literal copy is I've taken it, perhaps I've done something trivial to it. And in those cases, it's not impossible that a non-literal copy could be transformative, but it is highly unlikely. And what we haven't been talking about are those circumstances in which what has been created or produced is closer to a non-literal copy. And what do we do about those circumstances? And in a circumstance like that, to just automatically defer to, well, you maybe you're trying to say something. And so we're going to like, you know, defer to, uh, uh, to that side. I think you're actually going against the grain of what both copyright and fair use is intended to um, encourage. All right, thank you. So um, I am so delighted um, that you all came and I'm so grateful to my panelists for, um, for your preparation and your thoughtfulness and your patience um, and your inability to say everything that you wanted to say. Um, but um, I, after I give the audience uh, an opportunity to thank you, I wanna invite all of us to walk down the hall for a reception and hopefully we can have some uh, more unrecorded conversation. Sorry to our online audience. Um, so join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>